Before I get into the video here, I'm going to briefly talk about what this series is. So this is meant to be an update to my audio classification series that I made on YouTube uh, a long time ago, mainly because people still view those videos and watch it start to finish. And uh, the problem with that is that there's so many changes that I would make to modernize that code a little bit and clean up a lot of the issues that people have had with it to the point that it warrants a remake. So the main difference here is we're actually going to be doing our time domain to frequency domain computations in real time, like while the model's training um, on the GPU. And uh, the way that's going to kind of happen is we're going to use this library written by this guy um, called Capri. And um, another cool thing about this series is that I have uploaded all the code already. So um, the way I'm going to kind of introduce this, it's just going to be a couple videos kind of talking about a lot of the theory behind things and explain a lot of the code um, and give you a lot of it up front. So uh, you can follow along from the readme if you want and you can you can watch all the videos. So uh, let's get into the first video here. All right, guys, welcome to the first video of the remake of the audio classification series. Uh, we're going to be calling it the Capri edition. And so what we're going to be doing here is pretty much walking through conceptually what needs to happen um, to build some kind of deep learning pipeline to classify audio data. And the code will all be provided for you. So it should be very simple to plug in your own audio data and try out a couple of these architectures that we're going to be talking about. Um, and the way this is going to kind of work is we're going to start with uh, 300 audio files of these 10 classes here. And we're going to be building our models around that data. And that data will already be in the GitHub repo. So, uh, But in this first video, we're just going to be talking about digital signal processing theory, some of the background knowledge that you need to know before we get into everything. So let's talk a little bit about the Fourier transform. Um, when you sample audio data, we typically sample at a rate that is, is very rapid, so something like 44.1 kilohertz or 44,100 samples in just one second of time. Um, we're also going to be using, in, in this example actually, we're just going to be using 16-bit audio, meaning that there are 2 to the 16 different integers that we can use to measure our audio signals, so that's can show you guys here it's 2 to the 16th um, and that range can be seen kind of on the y-axis and uh, this is typically how we like think about audio we think about it in the time domain but um, it's very hard to kind of see and differentiate between some of those plots that we saw in the previous slide because it's time domain it's just a bunch of numbers going up and down and so one way that we can resolve this is to convert into the frequency domain typically um, by something known as the fast Fourier transform. And so when we're sampling audio, let's say I'm sampling audio at like 16 kilohertz. We have something called a Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency here is going to be exactly half of our sampling rate. So if I'm sampling at 16K, um, the highest frequency that I can reasonably capture from our microphone recording is going to be 8 kilohertz. So if something is happening at like 10 kilohertz, it's not going to show up within our recording. Um, so uh, when you take the fast Fourier transform, you'll create this plot on the right. And this plot is typically called a periodogram. And you can tell it goes from uh, 0 hertz to our Nyquist frequency, which is going to be here 8,000 for a sampling rate of 16,000. And we have very precise, like not only can I tell that there's a lot of low frequency content here, I can tell the very specific frequencies that these peaks occur at. So this is very helpful in terms of, you know, hopefully being able to describe that this is, you know, an acoustic guitar that I'm listening to. So now this brings us into the topic of the short time Fourier transform or the STFT. So um, when we have the fast Fourier transform, we can take it a step further by taking lots of FFTs over time and stack up our periodograms to create something called a spectrogram. So let's kind of just walk through what that process would look like if I have a, a 16 kilohertz signal. 
So there are kind of main two main things, which is like the window length and the step size. And these can change depending, and you can try them out to see what they look like. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly this, but we're going to go through our time series signal with a certain window length. So every 400 samples, we're going to pad these 400 samples out with additional zeros to meet the next highest power of two because you need um, powers of two to actually take FFT in the first place. And then we move along that time series and we step a certain amount of samples. So for example, if I was here, I'll step forward. And what you'll notice is that we're only stepping by like 160. So there's gonna be a little bit of an overlap from our previous signal. And so one thing that we can also do is we can kind of filter this down with uh, an Hamming window. So we don't necessarily let like all the signal through, but as it turns out, like on average, this will still create a really nice uh, picture when you actually look at it. So to the right here, this is what happens when we stack all our periodograms up over time. So um, if we have a step size of 10 milliseconds, that means we're gonna have 100 uh, time series samples within our spectrogram. So on the x-axis here, we actually have time. And so you can see a lot of these are, uh, I guess, what's a good example? Acoustic guitar, like you hit the strings and then they slowly die out. So you can watch the, not only does the frequency change, but it, it kind of reduces intensity. And um, this is actually called a decibel spectrogram. So we take the log base 10 of the original spectrogram and I'll kind of show you that later on. Um, the other notable thing here is that, so the dimension is like 257. This 257 is exactly half of the number of points in our FFT. And that should seem really familiar because, you know, I just talked about the Nyquist frequency. This is actually exactly half the number of um, points of our FFT. So it's kind of the Nyquist frequency showing itself. So at the at the top here, we have low frequency and then at the, the bottom, we have the highest frequency. So now let's actually take a look at uh, a normal spectrogram versus a log spectrogram. So on the left, we have um, the output of what a normal STFT would look like. And then you have an option to take uh, the log of that and you'll get a decibel spectrogram. And in my opinion, the decibel spectrogram looks a lot more interesting. And I figured I would just kind of show you guys like visually what this looks like in comparison because Capri does have an option where you can toggle this on and off. So now let's actually talk a little bit about the MEL scale. So when we have, um, you know, different changes in audio frequencies, uh, if you were to give a human uh, a 50 hertz signal and a 100 hertz signal, you say, hey, tell me which one's the lower frequency, which one's the higher frequency. Uh, most people will be able to get that no problem, right? It's very obvious to us. We can very clearly hear changes in lower frequencies. Um, but let's imagine it was a, a 20,050 and 20,100. Well, if you've ever listened to something that's that high pitched, it's gonna be impossible for a human to tell the difference between those two. And so one way of re-binning the audio and rephrasing it, um, especially for machine learning, is to rescale our audio with the MEL filter bank. And so for example here, on the x-axis, we have our original frequency. And you notice if you have a really small change at these lower frequencies, we get we start to push them further and further apart. So we assign more importance to lower frequencies, and we uh, don't assign as much importance to higher frequencies. So if we have a small difference in a higher frequency, they look almost identical, or they're closer together in the MEL scale. And what this kind of looks like and one thing we can do is we can build something called a filter bank. And a filter bank is actually a bunch of triangular filters where we'll create something called like MEL, uh, let's just call them like MEL binned uh, filter banks. So when we pass an actual triangular filter over our periodogram that we had earlier, in fact, we could probably go look at this here. This is our periodogram. Let's put a triangular filter over that. And so, it's the same thing as just saying, um, for our first Melbin, put a triangular filter over that and return to me whatever you get. And so we keep going, keep going, and what you would build up is different bins for each of our frequencies. So we're actually just rescaling 
what's happening within our periodogram and converting it to the MEL scale via these triangular filters. So this actually takes us into our last slide, which is going to be, you know, who would have guessed it, the MEL spectrogram. That's where we take our original spectrogram and we re-bin it based on this MEL filter bank that we're taking. Um, so I realized like in the last slide, there were 26 filters. Um, so this would be like 26 bins for our MEL scale to fall into. Uh, in this example, we're going to be using 128. Um, this is kind of like the highest, the highest end for these MEL spectrograms. You can change this depending on uh, what you want. Like you could easily set this to 40. 40 is a common number you'll see. 26 is quite common. Um, but it's really up to you. Um, the main impact of this is the amount of memory that's going to be taken up by your machine learning algorithm and how fast it's going to be able to run. Um, so if you make it too small, then it might be able to run really quickly, but the accuracy might be lower. And so that's something you can think about tuning as you go forward. But if you actually look at it, like if you look at the original spectrogram for like a cello, You'll see that like all of these are very evenly spaced out. And then once you get over here to the higher frequencies, these actually uh you're seeing all the energies being like concentrated at the top of that triangle. So you can see each like triangular filter and how the energies kind of start to stack up. Um so it really doesn't like ruin the signal, it just rephrases it to be a little more relevant for for humans and machine learning. So um, that'll be it for this first video. And in the next video, we're actually going to be, it's still going to be a lot of like slideshows and stuff, but we'll actually be running some code um, and getting started with all that. So I'll see you guys there.